Thank God for that truth. Luke chapter 6, we'll go there with me this morning, verse 39. And uh, really, let's back up here just a little bit. Let's go ahead and go back to verse 36, if you don't mind, church. The Bible says, and the Jesus speaking here to his disciples, Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Verse 37, Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaking together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And he spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master. But every one that is perfect shall be as his master. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but perceivest thou not the beam that is in thine own eye? Either how canst thou, canst thou say that thy, to thy brother, Brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine eye, when thou thyself beholdest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to pull out the mote that is in thy brother's eye. For a good tree bringeth forth not corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit, and for of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Back in verse 36, as I've told you, I believe that's a key uh, to the surrounding verses before and even after up here through verse 45 as we try to understand what God's given us through the Holy Spirit at the pen of Luke here in Luke chapter 6. Uh, be ye therefore merciful. That means we're treating people better than they deserve. I mean, that's, no, that doesn't come naturally. That comes super, that's a supernatural work for us to treat people better than they deserve. You know, we've, we've learned as we've studied this before, as we've looked to, through two other messages here. Again, there's been a little separation in us dealing with Luke chapter 6. And we've had some other things that we've dealt with in God's word. But we know that what's described here and not judging people, not condemning people, and putting other people first, treating people better than they deserve is not done in our own power. It's done in the power of the Spirit. And you and I must do what? We must declare a spiritual bankruptcy. Have you done that yet, or are, are we still playing the role of the Pharisee? Christ will deal with us here if we are in this passage. We must declare a spiritual bankruptcy. It's not within you, and it's not within me to treat people better than they deserve. In fact, I kind of like it when people get what they deserve, so, as long as it's not me. As long as it's not me. I kind of enjoy it when people get what they deserve. In fact, sometimes when I'm trying to teach my children right now, Nathaniel's in the process of, of uh, he's completed all the work that he needs to to have a driver's license. And, um, and I'm, I'm, most, I'm, I'm fearful about him driving on his own like most parents would be. I'm also fearful about paying the insurance on that. I'm praying about that. That's going to change a little bit. My friends are going to help me with that soon. But, uh, but all that's going to take place. But I'll tell him, I say, see, if you do this, then that's what's going to happen. If you pull in traffic like this and you're not looking ahead, that's your, what's going to happen to you is what, see, they, they deserve what happened to them because they weren't watching what they were doing. Don't you do that, Nathaniel, and almost take pleasure in the fact you get what you deserve, but God's saying be therefore merciful. And, and so we have to bring it all the way down to where we live and realize it's not just a practical change of life, it's a spiritual way of life, and we have to wave the white flag and say, Lord, I don't do this. And, Lord, I know that this is what you've asked me to do. In fact, you've commanded me to do this. This is a requirement. I'm asking you to help me. Uh, we, it takes a bit of humility for you and I to admit that we're not going to do this any other way except spiritually. Uh, we have to sometimes get, get down to that level and realize that. That's what happens here in Luke chapter 6. We have to declare a, a complete spiritual bankruptcy, completely relying on the spiritual resources we have as believers. I trust you know the Lord. Now, without the Lord, it's impossible, right? Uh, but we have a spiritual bankruptcy. Thank God we have spiritual resources that we can draw on through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit that lives in us. Amen. The Spirit lives in you permanently. Permanently. He takes his mail at your address. He lives in you. Have you, have you gotten a sense that the Holy Spirit's living in you at all this past week? Mm. Yeah. What about my life has demonstrated the fact that the Holy Spirit's living in me? I tell you what, there's a whole lot of things in my life I could say, I don't know the Holy Spirit had anything to do with that. Personally, 
I don't know if the Holy Spirit had anything to do with that behavior or that thought or that activity, but in my life, where am I, where am I seeing this? It's in the supernatural behaviors, and one of the most supernatural behaviors there is is showing mercy, being merciful. In this passage we're reading here in Luke 6 and studying, we, we know that Christ is speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his leaders. He's speaking to his leaders. He's training these men to move from the ranks of disciples to be apostles who will take the gospel around the world. And that key in verse 30, that, that phrase in verse 36, again, is a key to what we're trying to do. What we're seeing here now as we move beyond this in this passage, as we continue to study, as we get down to verse 39, 40, 41, and 42, in this hour is the fact that we must judge ourselves all the the way down to the heart level not just judge ourselves by our outward observable actions but judge ourselves all the way down to the motivating factors of our heart that's where we must go that's where I must go as a believer and so it looks here in verse 37 if you look back there with me in God's word for a moment so rather than uh, judging uh, rather than judging and condemning others we must do what we are told to do here in verse 39 and make sure that we are not blind while trying to lead the blind can the blind lead the blind, he says here. Verses 41 and 42, then we must take the log or the moat out of our own eyes so we can try to help get the speck out of someone else's. We can't help someone else with the specks that we think we see because we've got a log in our own eye, like a foundational pillar to a dwelling place. That's what Jesus is referring to. It's almost humorous, almost comical. It sounds a little sarcastic, but I wouldn't accuse the Lord Jesus of that. So you've got to get the log out of your own eye. Verses 43, 44, and 45, I believe that our time uh, will we'll make it so that we'll deal with that tonight. But it deals with our heart and the fruit of our heart and, and our judgmental words and those kind of things. And, 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 and whether we're, we're, we're executing our, our actions in bitterness or in mercy. But this morning I want us to see for just a few minutes that we have together what, what the Lord says here in verse 39 through 42. And first of all, if we're going to execute a lifestyle of mercy... Mercy to people, treating them better than they deserve, doing more for them than they deserve, looking out for them better than they deserve, being a better Christian to them than they may even deserve. We must judge our own sins or we're going to be like the blind leading the blind. We must do business, do judgment on our own self. By the way, the Bible explains to us if we'll judge ourselves right, we'll not be judged. We'll judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. Verse 39 and 40, can a, he spoke a parable here. And he, can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Those are scary words there. I'm looking at people this morning. All of you have some level of influence, some level of authority over someone or some situation. And what I, must, what I know as the pastor, and it's the most condemning thing I could say to you today or even think, that it is as unreasonable to expect you to exceed my level of Christianity is unreasonable for me to expect you to exceed my level of spirituality. If that is my prayer for you, then it must be the practice of my life. If I'm to preach to you about putting this into your life and to taking, taking this out of your life, then I must raise my own level of spirituality. If I desire that for my wife and children, I can't expect more out of them than I'm willing to be in Christ. I can want more, but I, if I expect more and I want more, then I'm going to have to be that more. It makes you just want to resign your leadership and go sit in the corner by yourself till Jesus comes because you feel so inadequate. Anybody else feel like that? Some of you are even uh, big brothers and big sisters. You have a degree of, of influence and responsibility. Oh, you're good at picking out the, the problems with your siblings, but if they're ever going to be what you say they ought to be, you're going to have to be that first. You're ever going to have an employee that's going to rise to the level that you think there ought to be, then you're going to have to be that first. If you're going to ha have any situation, that you're going to have a spouse that's going to rise to the level that you think they ought to be at. My friend, you better be there first. Well, you better be there first. God help us to want to get there first. And not just so they will come along, that spouse or that child or that employee or that it, it, whatever relationship we could imagine or speak of this morning or whatever situation it might be. But may God help us desire it because that's where the Lord wants us to be personally. See, Jesus is urging his disciples to examine himself. Now, again, you just imagine, he said, it's, it's, can the blind lead the blind? Imagine uh, that one day you decided you wanted to fly to Nepal and climb Mount Everest. Wouldn't that be a great idea? Uh, as long as we take a few oxygen tanks with us, I think I might be willing to try. 
You go through the whole process of planning a great adventure like that. You go, you go on the world wide web. You surf the internet. You find a travel agency. You book, you book it all. You get the airfare together. You get the bus and the taxi tickets. You get to Kathmandu, and you 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 get a guide service uh, that gets is supposed to guide you to climb the mountain. But when you arrive, the day you arrive to the mountain to begin your climb, you realize that every single blind guy that is, is is employed there is blind. I don't know about you, but I have no intention of going up Mount Everest with a blind guide. That sounds pretty dangerous, doesn't it? Well, that's the same thing the Lord is saying here. You and I wouldn't feel comfortable climbing that dangerous ascent with a person who cannot see. And what God is saying here, that the leaders and the guides and the teachers in our life need to see better than those we influence. We need to see better than those we influence. It's so convicting to me personally. This is a prevailing principle in God's word that we ought to strive to follow. We try to strive to follow it in our church, asking those that are leading and teaching to make an example for God's glory that other people could walk in. Not just the words that we would utter behind a podium in a classroom uh, with adults or children, but that we would live in such a way that would honor the Lord Jesus Christ, that people could follow us as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What an awesome and incredible and unbelievable, impossible task. That's why we, we refer to our master clubs a moment ago. These folks that are, li, are, are serving, they, they can't be perfect. They can be complete in Christ, but they, they are going to make mistakes. The people that are serving in this church in our Sunday school classes, we just taught there are people serving our families in the nursery ministry now, serving our families through our children's services that are taking place now. They're not perfect that they never make a mistake. They can be complete in Christ, but we're asking them. We're saying this is a requirement here that you would follow Christ in such a way that others could follow in your footsteps and also follow Jesus Christ. Uh, that's, that's the goal. The blind, uh, can the blind lead the blind? That, if that, is a, that is a recipe for disaster, for falling into the ditch, Jesus is saying here. Yeah. Jesus teaches that a blind man cannot, cannot guide a blind man, and every pupil will become like his teacher. Would you go with me to Matthew chapter 15 for a few moments this morning? We'll get there in just a moment. And Jesus is referring to the Pharisees and the scribes as he's teaching here in Luke chapter 6. He refers to them there in Matthew chapter 15. When we speak of the Pharisees, people that uh, we are much maligned in churches like this, and probably any, any church that would stand up and try to open the Bible, the Pharisees are under attack. They were, but you know who they were? They were the teachers of the people of Israel in that day. And Jesus was rebuking these Pharisees for not completely doing the things that God wanted them to do. They were putting their own practices and their own traditions above God's desires for them. Their religion was only on the outside and on the inside. And even the best Christian at times, we struggle with being performers, but not truly possessing all that God wants us to have and all that God wants us to be. I, I don't know about you, but I cry guilty. I cry guilty. It's easy to perform this task without the power of God and without the help of God. And it's easy to hit the marks. And as we, we, we talk of this often, God help us to rise to the level by the Spirit of God. See, the, the Pharisees knew what to say. They knew the right thing to say. They knew the right thing to do. The right thing that would help people and impress people. They could connect the dots. But God saw that their heart wasn't right and their obedience wasn't complete. It's possible. It is possible, believe it or not, to do all these things and not be complete in Christ and not be who Jesus wants us to be, but simply to be a blind guide, a blind guide leading the blind. Matthew chapter 15 there, if you'll look with me in God's word for just a moment. Jesus here gives a, a descriptive uh, description, really, of the Pharisees and their behavior and their life. And verse, we'll just pick up there at verse 1. It says here, Then came, Jesus, came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do the disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now, let's just stop for a minute. The word tradition is, is really, uh, really a word that gets a lot, of, uh, a lot of allegiance. By the way, there are things that, that I, would, I would say this, there are things that we know God blesses that are much more than a tradition. Uh, preaching and teaching the Bible is not a tradition. It's not a tradition. Making that the center point of a worship service or a church gathering is not a tradition. I believe it's the command of God. We are in the stream that we know God blesses. And thank God, as long as we have a preacher who's a believer and who believes God's word, we can have the help of God through the word of God. Now, I'll, so I don't want us to confuse traditions, but, but sometimes there are certain things that we do that will rise to the level of tradition. Jesus is calling that out. You transgress God by your tradition. Listen, traditions are meaningless unless there's something that God has ordained and blessed. 
The way we do things must be yielded to God. We must allow God to lead in God. Jesus continues to talk here, verse 3, but he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the tradition of God by your traditions? Verse 4, but God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and ye he that curseth father or mother, let him die that die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whose whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. They've taken what God said said, turned it into their form of it, and are asking God to bless it. And Jesus says in verse 7, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, with their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude and said unto them, hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his, came his disciples and said unto him, knowest thou that the fair Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. We see this again given here. The Lord speaking of this. I want to remind you of this. As much blind as the Pharisees are, I want to promise you this. There are some very well-intentioned people among their ranks. Well-intentioned people, by the way, that were being led by blind leaders. And this, by the way, let's just confess openly. Are you, are you still with me here this morning? I know it's so quiet. I can hear a pen drop in here this morning. I'm not sure what's going on. We're asking God to help us. But, but it's, it, is, it is difficult to live, live the Christian life. Anybody want to say amen right there? And so anytime you can find some little formula that works and you feel like you've done it right, that seems like a good thing, doesn't it? Man, whew, I went to church today. Mm, that, that feels like the right. I'm glad I did that. I feel good about that. I'm with you on that. I feel good about it too. <laughs> I, was able to get a, I was able to read the Bible today. I'm check that. That's good. I was able to hand out a gospel tract today. That's good. And these are good things. I want you to know there are pe good people that are striving to find some process and some formula. I just want you to know we've got to get it, got to get it in the right order where the process doesn't come before the person of Jesus Christ. What, and that's what I have to keep reminding myself. I mean, we have to keep hitting the same nail in my life. I assume in the life of this church, we can perform, we can perform, but it just can be empty. We can find a process where we feel like we've completed the task, but what we need is to, to just draw close to the person of Jesus Christ. All the, the process will come to pass if we are close to the person of Jesus. And God help me not to put the process above the person of Jesus. That, that is so, by the way, we've all done that. We've all, and by the way, I, I, I'm glad you keep doing your duty. I'm glad I, I have the, at least have the strength by God's help to keep doing my duty when there's an emptiness, when there's a, when, when, it, when, when whatever there's there, when there's a melee is there, whatever, when there's an emptiness, keep trudging ahead for the Lord. I'm not going to quit. But how much better is it in when we are near the person of the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and the process happens supernaturally, I should say, not naturally. It will happen when we're following the person of Jesus Christ. That's, and listen, we, so the Pharisees, if somebody walked in today and said, I'm a Pharisee, I'm a Pharisee, we'd all want to jump on them and just, and just, just who are you and what do you, who do you think you are? And the truth is, if we look deep, it's in our DNA too. Mm -hmm. And not, not because we're trying to be wicked, but we're trying to solve the Christian life without Jesus. We're trying to live the Christian life without Jesus. We're, we're just prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. How about you? Anybody else feel that? And so when we look at here, what happens is when we check the boxes, there's some good boxes and then some boxes of tradition that we add to it. And we check those two. Then we basically take up the role of Pharisees. And then when we accomplish those things that we have set as a parameter of a good Christian, then we start to feel pride in our hearts. Then pride enters in. It's kind of, that's the, the downward trend, isn't it? So we, we, have, we struggle with following Christ as we struggle living by the Holy Spirit. And we try to find a way to at least soothe our conscience by doing this, 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 and this. And then next thing we know, because we did this, this, and this, and we didn't do what the Holy Spirit really said to do, but we think we're really good because we got the this, this, and this done. And we've left the person apart from what we've done. Uh, that's where we live. And that's how you become a Pharisee. You become a Pharisee, by not, not with necessarily with the most wicked intentions, but sometimes just trying to solve the problem of doing battle on your own flesh. Isn't that true? Yeah. 
That's, that at least is my experience. So I want you to know, pair of Pharisees are marked by spiritual pride, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be condemnation there. Christ condemns them, but he's trying to awaken them trying to awaken them that what, we, what they have put in place of the person of Christ falls far short of what he intended. And there, the spiritual pride that comes along with checking the boxes that we've created is not what God wants. We must confront, as he was encouraging the Pharisees, to confront their own sins, acknowledge their constant need of God's grace. It's all of Christ, isn't it? All of Christ or nothing, this Christian life. So he's warning his disciples. Again, he's saying here, can the blind lead the blind? He's dealing with the Pharisees, dealing with their teaching. They are with earshot of what he's saying, no doubt, as they're mixed into that crowd. Remember, this is if we go all the way back in this passage, this is going back in time as far as our teaching. Jesus had come down off the mount. This is this sermon here as he comes down off the mount, and he's teaching to them. He's telling them how to live as a Christian. He's saying we've got to be merciful, and you've got to do all these things. He's he's just called his apostles out of the disciples. He's just labeled the 12 as a this close-knit group that he's going to work through for the next few years to get his work done on earth and even beyond his death and his resurrection here. He's picked them. He's teaching them. He's training them. Other disciples are listening. No doubt Pharisees are mixed into all this. And he's telling them, if you follow the way of the Pharisees, you're going to fall into the pit of self-righteousness. And no doubt it is a pit. But if they follow the Lord, they will become merciful just like God is merciful. The Lord is warning his disciples. He's warning his teachers who will become leaders that they ought to be careful about whom they follow. We must follow Jesus. Amen. And if we are to follow a man, if we are to follow the teachings of a pastor, God help us. If we are to follow the teachings of a Bible teacher, may God help us to see Jesus in that person. May we follow them as they follow the Lord. It goes back to the truth that we try to teach often. Be careful about who you allow to influence you for the Lord. I want you to know that every person that has, that has a podcast and every person that has a program on the radio or on the TV or on the Internet, whatever, every person, and it's not my business necessarily to know who is right and who is wrong, but I want you to know every person that has access to the airwaves is not necessarily following the Lord, and you, should, you shouldn't be following them either, by the way. Some people become easy targets because of their great popularity. And because they're, they are so popular and people have delved into the skeletons in their closet, we know things about them we wish we didn't know. Some very popular so-called preachers uh, have an idea that if I had a, had a public forum like that, I would, I would be working hard to keep people out of my closet too. But some of those folks are teaching damnable heresies. And please be careful. The discerning spirit of the Holy, of the Holy God will help you to figure out, I'm going to turn the channel here. <laughs> I'm going to find another podcast there. I'm going to listen to another radio preacher here because they're not teaching the truth of the word of God. You know, if you're not sure about that, ask God to help you. I believe God's by his Holy Spirit will keep you from following blind leaders. Don't follow a blind leader. How can I know a leader's blind? God will show you. His Holy Spirit will help you. By the way, other Christians can help you. I know all of us Christians, we have strong opinions. If you ask us about something, we're going to let you know that person's awful. And you might be shocked. And, of course, then we have no proof of it. We just don't like them. A lot of times we're just jealous of their popularity and their success. If, we're not, if we'd be honest, that, that stings us first. I've heard some preachers preach against men like Joel Olstein never mention his, his doctrinal issues. They're just, they're just upset that he has 45 or 50,000 people come to his church every weekend. They wish they could figure out a way to do it too. Well, the, the trouble goes much deeper than that, <laughs> Right? Excuse me for picking on preachers, but I guess that's a good group to pick on here. I'm one of them this morning. We get jealous about the success. And God help us. Listen, the blind leading the blind. Don't, don't follow false teachers. You say, how can I know they're false? God's spirit will help you. God's people will help you. There's no question about that. The blind leading the blind is disastrous. Amen. But that's why I would ask for your help. Pray for the preacher. Yeah. You don't have to like the preacher to pray for him. He needs your help. The preacher is standing in the pulpit, and that happens to be my, my job in this place primarily. I'm glad I'm able to share this, other, this pulpit with other men that know the Lord and love the Lord. I'm glad to do that. But we need your help. We want, we're not, God willing, God willing, God willing, God willing. We're not up here creating some sort of following for ourselves. God willing, we are trying to point people to Jesus Christ. But do we understand that's a supernatural effort? Left to the natural, I will err. Any preacher would err. God, help me to never be a blind leader leading the blind. We want a blind leader leading a Sunday school class. Oh, I sure don't want a blind leader leading any of our young people. 
Uh, but we realize that the blindness comes on us gradually. Sometimes it comes because you and I are trying to figure out some way to be a better Christian without Jesus. And that happens naturally, not supernaturally. Uh, the blind, leading the blind. Listen, there's a, as far as our sight goes, and I've, I've said so much about it, let me say again what happens here in the next couple of verses here. We must, uh, we must also, in verse 41 and verse 42, we've got to judge our own sins. We've got to judge our own sins so that we can be able to help others with theirs. Is it true that Christians can help other people with their sin and help call that out and help walk them through that, help them walk through the process of repentance? Yes, that's a biblical teaching and a biblical truth. But we can't do it until we get the log out of our own eye <laughs> that foundational beam or pillar that would go in, into a large dwelling place that you might imagine at a beach house or even bigger. Get that out of my eye so that we can work on that little bitty speck that I happen to see in yours. It's amazing you and I can see. We're really good at seeing other people's problems with that big log in our own eye. I don't know how we do it. I mean, that's talent, isn't it? Well, truth is, and I'm speaking of myself, not you, it's just wicked. It helps me when I find you doing something wrong. It helps me when I see you falling below some certain standard that I think maybe I've created or maybe I suppose that God's created. It helps me because when you fall short, then boy, that just, whoo, then I go, I go way up in my own eyes. I know you would never do that. So when, you, when, you're, when you're not quite hitting the mark, you're quite, quite getting everything done like you ought to and doing every, not being every place you ought to be, I'm like, yeah, I knew that about them. Then it is, and without even saying, I'm like, whoo. I'm, getting, I'm, I'm, I'm moving up in the top five of Christians that I know. And next thing I know, I'm going to be the number one ranked Christian in my own life. It's, 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 it happens. It happens. We must judge our own sins. God wants us to help one another. That's what he says here in verse 41 and 42. Let me read it, and we'll try to close this out in just a moment. And why beholdest thou the motes in thy brother's eye, but perceivest thou not the beam that's in thine own eye? Either how canst thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote that is in thine own eye? How can we help him? When thou by, beholdest thyself, beholdest not the beam that's in thy own eye. Thou hypocrite. We become a hypocrite without even trying. We become a Pharisee without even trying. And that's, that's what happens. It's ridiculous for us to be able to think we can help someone until we deal with ourselves. And again, Jesus, I think, again, it's almost humorous when you think about the word picture that's given here. But how do we know this is happening? And in my own life, how do I know it's happening? I'm quick to blame other people. I'm slow to blame myself. Quick to blame others, slow to blame myself. If, if something happens and someone, someone uh, takes a part of my time away, and I, I may say, uh, what, what, they're not here at the right time. They're not here when they said they would be here. I'll inconsider it. Don't they know that I'm busy? But if I'm late for an appointment, I realize I'm just a busy person, and they, I just can't help being late. It's not judging myself according to the standard that I'm setting for other people. It's me excusing my wild driving in traffic because I've got to get somewhere. I've got to get something done. And when anybody behaves like that, I think they're lower than the devil and I want to blow my horn and tell them about it. Like I tried to do yesterday. Yeah. It's me holding other people to a different standard than I hold it to. I know these aren't popular things. We have to be careful again to get the log out of our own eye. You know, if we will get the log, the positive part, if we will get it out, we can help somebody. And isn't that what God's put in our heart to do anyway, to be a help to somebody? Yep. It's easy to identify the problem. Everybody's good at that. But very few of us are willing to let the Spirit of God work through us so that we can help solve the problem. Yep. So I can help solve the problem. That, that's where I'm struggling. That's where I, I you know, when, when marriages struggle, when marriages struggle, I read one preacher talking about this truth as he dealt with married couples. And he said, that, that's something I find in marriage counseling. When marriage struggles, the, and when a, a woman would come in, a wife would come in, and you ask her what the problem is, and, and immediately she may say, I have my faults. I, 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 could, I could be a good wife if my husband, husband wasn't so inconsiderate and wasn't so selfish. The husband, the same thing he would say. He said, I'm not perfect, but that woman is impossible to please. And off he goes with a long list of all her faults. The Bible says this, if we're going to help someone, we're going to have to get the log out of our eyes so we can deal with the speck that's in their eye. We've got to, we've got to deal with ourselves. If we're blind to our own faults, our judgment of others shows us to be hypocrites. It may, it, it, and it's obvious to everyone but us, one commentator said. That's the scary part of it. That's the scary part of it. It's obvious to everybody else but us. Romans chapter 2 and verse 17. Would you go there with me for a moment? 
As we think about being merciful unto others, uh, we, the blind cannot lead the blind. God help us not to be blind leaders, but true, truly following the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we must deal with our own sin, get the log out of our own eye, and get the moat out of our own eye so that we can help uh, someone who's dealing with the speck in their own eye. Romans chapter 2 and verse 17, I'll read this passage. Behold, uh, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou art a guide and of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou, therefore, which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Bring on to verse 22. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou uh, abhor, commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, thou though, through breaking the law, dishonoring, dishonorest thou God? Excuse me, verse 24. For the name of God is blaspheming among the Gentiles through you as it is written. For the circumcision verily profiteth if it keepeth, keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the circumcision keepeth the righteousness of the law shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision and shall not uncircumcision which is by nature if it fulfill the law judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly that's the key phrase it's not just about the outward sign neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh but he is Jew which is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God man looks on the outward appearance but God looks where my friend remember the life of David and David's sin with Bathsheba his adultery in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1 God used Nathan to come speak to David, King David. He was the lead his men into battle. He stayed back from battle. He saw a beautiful woman. He had a relationship with that woman. And that, and that woman, he ended up having her, that woman's husband murdered in order to protect the relationship. And the child that was born out of that relationship, it's amazing how far sin will take us. By the way, you tell me, class, David was a man after whose own heart? Thank God, by the way, he was a man after God's own heart before his sin and he was also called a man after God's own heart after this egregious sin aren't you glad for forgiveness I mean everything I'm saying today probably sounds so depressing but the good news is there's a way back there's forgiveness there's restoration there's reconciliation all those things but you know in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1 David had to go through the crucible of being confronted by the truth of God and by the man of God by another a believing man it was Nathan in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew together with him and with his children, and he did of his own meat, and he drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was unto him a daughter, as a daughter, and there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress the, for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said unto Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, because he, has no, he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. You and I would react the same way. But you and I are David. I am the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed the king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. David was judging the speck in that rich man's eye when he had a log in his own eye. He had done the same thing in taking his neighbor's wife, and yet he was blind to his own sin while judging another's. It's amazing to think a man after God's own heart could be guilty of that. That's why I have no shame in preaching this to all of us this morning. <laughs> preaching it to myself, and certainly I'll fall short of being labeled a man after God's own heart. And I'm glad the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The word of God will help us. 
The Word of God shines a light into places that you and I can't even find on our own that reveals to us the Phariseeism and even the hypocrisy that is, is, is nestled in to the dark corners of our lives. Have you ever been working outside until it was dark? You might have thought as you looked at yourself in the, in the dark hours, just a little bit of sunlight out there, said, well, you know what? I'm really not that dirty. I don't know how I did it, but I'm not as dirty as I thought I was. I, I don't look too bad. And you walk into the house and flip on the light and walk into the bathroom and look in the mirror and to your chagrin and almost horror, you're totally filthy. And that's what the Word of God does. When the light of the Word of God shines, it shows the filth that you and I don't see. Or maybe that we excuse or whatever the case may be. That's the way God's word is. You know, I think I'm a loving person. And then I read 1 Corinthians 13 and I'm reminded I'm not the loving person I ought to be. God's word is like that. And God's word is what will help us to get the log out of our own eye. God's word, once we, we get that, by the way, we can really be a help to our brother. We can finally say, brother, I, I want to help you with that speck. I'm not here to condemn you because of it. I want to, I want to, in humility, be merciful, not judgmental, not be insensitive, but be understanding. And God help us to allow that to be true in our life. You know, each of us is spiritually blind before we come to Christ, aren't we? And thank God for the light that shined in the darkness and has delivered us from darkness, from death unto life. But even in following Christ, there are times that the blinders come on. We allow, uh, we were overtaken by, by the sin of this world and we excuse things. We allow things. We value things. We, 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 we put ourselves in a place to try to live the Christian life. Maybe with some noble intention at first, we try to live the Christian life apart from the person of Jesus Christ. And we find ourselves in a place where we're blind. And God help us not to be blind, leading the blind. Especially when I come to my own family. My own family. Someone said that, that, that uh, like produces like. It's a sobering fact to think that I could influence someone and they could end up just like me spiritually. I want them to be better than that. But if I want better for them, I need to be that. I need to be that and you need to be that. And God help us to deal with that and to make God's word produce a holy conviction. Realize that, that we're waving the white flag of surrender. We're guilty. I'm guilty. The preacher's guilty. We're all guilty. We're guilty. We're guilty. We're guilty. But God, we're waving the white flag. We can't be merciful. We, we, we absolutely are prone to wonder. We're absolutely given to being a Pharisee. We're absolutely given to hypocrisy. And God help us to stop worrying about others. Help me to get right with you today. Amen. Help me. I don't want anybody to follow me to hell. I don't want anybody to follow me off a path that's anything less than God's best for their life. I don't want them to follow me in that direction. Lord, I don't want to always be judging people and never be able to help anybody because all I can do is see what's wrong, but I'm never in a place spiritually to try to help them. God, forgive me. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to do that this morning. Lord, we need your help. There are many encouraging things in your word, but this... Sometimes feels discouraging, but there is an encouraging thought. Your word will bring us out of this. Your spirit will bring us out of this. We are prone to wonder, but Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to draw us back. And Lord, I pray for our people, wonderful people, godly people, people that are striving for truth. And Lord, sometimes... I assume they're probably like me. We get so frustrated with ourselves and so desperate. Lord, I just think if I'll just do this, this, and this, and I'll, then I, I, can, I can be free from my guilt and, 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 and I can get on a better path. And, Lord, certainly you've designed the Christian life uh, with some things that ought to be a part of it. Prayer, the Bible reading, church attendance, giving, other things, witnessing, no doubt about it. Lord, those good things and even other things we might add to it. Lord, I pray we'd never let them take the place of you. Our relationship with you and, and cultivating and, 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 and growing a relationship with you, Lord. Help me to realize that all those things will come to pass as I draw near to you. And I pray I'd be preaching to a group of people that want to draw near, near, near to you. Draw us nearer now, Lord. Help us to see us as you see us. Help us to see ourselves in the light of the word to cleanse us. I pray if there's anyone here in the sound of my voice today that hasn't asked for eternal life and hasn't asked for your salvation, they'd realize the hopelessness of their life, but realize the hope they have in Jesus and come to be saved today. May they know they're amongst friends and we want to help and encourage them. If there's anyone here, any Christian, any believer that's in sin, they're on the edge of being trapped, Lord, or they're maybe making excuses, which we're all prone to do. Lord, I pray today we'd give that up and we allow the work of the word of God to cleanse us. And Lord, to, to
to open the way for us. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And would you stand with me, please? They begin to play a hymn of invitation.